thank you very much, Fuli, for agreeing to give about the soul seminar, and you can get started. Yeah, cool. Yeah, thank you for the invitation, Kate. It's, I'm really happy to be here and uh, giving some of the updates happening in my group. So my name is Uli Bay, and I'm working as a lecturer at the University of Surrey. So like lecture is equivalent to assistant professor. So I just started my job like a year and a half ago. So I'm currently actually building my teams up, right? So my background is a mixture of uh, structured DNA tech and uh, computational DNA tech. So today's talk, I will be basically talking about both aspects and uh, how I use them to, you know, build a cell. Mm -hmm. So I guess I can start sharing my screen, right? Yes, you should be able to share. Yep. Okay, yeah, so I've made my introduction, so I'll just uh, go straight um, away. Yeah. Oh, we great. see your we see your uh, presenter mode, so we mm. see the I'll slide notes. Sorry. Yeah, just give me a second. Maybe this? No. Um, Nothing. This. Or do you see my... We still... And now we just see the PowerPoint, not in a slide mode. I see. Mm, interesting. It was right the first time when you tested when yeah. we were chatting. Maybe I'll just share it again. Just give me a second. Yeah, we learn again, right? Never change your working system. <laughs> okay. Let's see. How does still it look? presenters. No, oh. still presenters mode. Okay. What I can do is I'll just pop out my screen and this will only give me the full oh, screen. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So I'm now Thank on you. a battery, so I have time limit of seven hours. <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah. Thank you for the invitation. I'll just start my presentation. So the today's talk. Uh, I will talk about like what is synthetic biology. That's the field that I'm working on, like everyone else as well, to be honest. And I'll just give you a brief introduction on the top-down synthetic biology and the bottom-up synthetic biology, where we try different approaches to engineer biological systems. And I'll give you introduction about uh, the DNA and RNA nanotechnology, where I basically work on. And then uh, I'll just introduce uh, several research projects that's going on in my lab currently. Yeah. So what is synthetic biology? Yeah, this term has been around for yeah, quite a years. And uh, to be honest, uh, even I sometimes struggle to define it in simple terms, right? So I think it's best to actually start with the examples. Yeah. So we have actually seen a lot of media coverage about synthetic biology. For example, people have it developed like this molecules that can uh, give you this vanilla flavor uh, from microorganisms. Uh, we also have an example of a microorganism whose DNA has been completely based on synthesized, man synthesized DNA. We also have uh, some engineer microorganism that can produce or sometimes even digest those plastics, right? So those are like typical examples of the media coverage of synthetic biology. So if I try to then define it, then, you know, like this microorganism we have, we like to actually engineer it uh, so that it performs some useful functions for us. So that's actually what's been doing in top-down synthetic biology, basically using some interchangeable biological parts to assemble some new biological system that acts uh, differently from previously, like unnaturally. But we also have some other branch of synthetic biology, which is not technically more recent, but which has been kind of formulated recent into this bottom-up synthetic biology category, which is using unnatural molecules to recreate those emergent lifelike behaviors uh, in biology. And with the final 
ambitious goal of creating artificial life. So that's the bottom of synthetic biology. So if we kind of try to put those two different approaches in a context, so we have, for example, this scale uh, systems where we have different level of complexity and uh, a biological system, uh, which is, for example, like more natural or less natural uh, in this uh, diagram. And the top-down synthetic biology would be, for example, taking a living organism uh, and engineer it. So, you know, go to achieve this system in the middle, which is the artificial biological system with some desired function. And then the bottom of synthetic biology will be using this uh, engineered molecules that usually goes to uh, self-assembly uh, to create similar level of systems, okay? So I'll just talk very briefly about this top-down synthetic biology first. Yep. So what people are doing quite often in this top-down synthetic biology is controlling the expression of biomolecules. Okay. And what do we mean by controlling the expression of biomolecules? That's usually proteins, because proteins are what uh, the workers of uh, life. So what do we mean by, by then? controlling the level of the proteins, okay? So we need to first think about how proteins are being expressed in different parts or different cells in the system, okay? So we have trillions of cells in our cell, in a, our human body, and we also have around 50,000 identified genomes which can produce different types of proteins. And do those uh, 50,000 proteins get expressed at the same time for all different kinds of cells in our body? That's actually not true. So for example, if you look at this human protein atlas project where people try to gather metadata on which proteins are being expressed in different parts, different organs of our body. So for example, if we look at brain cells, like neural cells that perform very specific function, we have more than 2,000 proteins being expressed. That's a lot, but that's still very small compared to the 50,000 identified genomes. And things get more interesting if we look, for example, at pancreas cell that has very specific purpose of producing some uh, molecules for digestion. They have identified around 200 or 300 proteins being uh, actively uh, expressed in pancreas cells. So that means even though we have a lot of genome information, you know, a lot of different types of proteins, they are highly regulated and only a handful of proteins are being expressed at the same time. So if you can control those protein expression levels, then we can actually induce quite a wide range of functions, for example, like including corresponding to those different types cell types in our body, okay? So how it is actually done in our cell, we are still yet to understand, but what we know so far is that those proteins and small molecules that are expressed inside cells, they interact each other. Sometimes they can activate other molecules or they can inhibit other molecules. And those series of reactions, if we have for example, like a handful of molecules, and they can form something called genetic circuits to express only certain types of molecules while inhibiting, for example, some other types of molecules, okay? So we have those circuit-like structure if we have several molecules, but in reality, we have a lot of molecules, right? So we have 50, at least, 50,000 types of proteins and much more molecules derived from it. So if we kind of try to draw, draw the type of interactions that we have identified among those molecules, you know, we have a lot of molecules and they interact with many other molecules. So if we draw their interactions, then their interaction will look like drawing a very complex map or network, okay? So basically this genetic network, which is a series of interactions among many biocomponents, basically determines which molecules will be 
actively expressed or not expressed at all or have a medium level expression and something like that. Okay, so in synthetic biology, we want to harness the part of this genetic network and design a new system with the benefits that we want in especially top-down synthetic biology. So I'll just give you a very simple example on our scheme on how it's actually done. So let's say we want to use uh, an E. coli, the simplest cell. So an E. coli will have a lot of biocomponents that we actually interact with the external input or changing conditions so that it can access a sensor layer of our circuit. So for example, you can have a bicomponent that can sense the presence of some chemicals or something like nutrients that you want, sugar molecules. You can also find a component that detects uh, presence of metal ions like magnesium, calcium. Some components will respond to light or change in the temperature, so heat. And of course, you can also interact with some nuclear acid molecules with specific sequences. So those will be, for example, your sensor layer. So you take those biocomponents that interact with specific input you want, and then you undergo those internal logic circuits. So there's lots of biocomponents available so that you can reconfigure them to form things like end gate, OR gate, NOR gate, or bistable systems and something like that. Yeah, so that will be your computational layer. And then basically you plug the output to the actuator layer, which can be, for example, uh, generation of first and signal by producing GFPs or RFPs, or it can also lead to uh, production of certain molecules or initiating the growth or inhibiting the growth or changing the be behavior, something like uh, tumbling or swimming behavior. Okay, so by combining different components for those three layers, like the goal of synthetic biology would be, then you be able to create an uh, arbitrarily uh, configured network by using those three components. Yeah. So I'm just gonna give you a very very simple example that I have done actually in vitro circuit. Okay. So. This is how we express uh, those biocomponents in uh, in biology. Okay, so this black line, I'll just bring up the cursor. Yeah, so this black line here is a piece of double-stranded DNA, so that will be the gene, and then this arrow here is a promoter, which means from this point, uh, the DNA will be transcribed into the RNA. And this T-shape is the terminator, which tells us that the production of the RNA transcription will stop here. So the production will only happen in between. And in the middle, I have the biocomponent, which is a light up optimer T broccoli. So basically, if I have this biocomponent, which is a piece of double-stranded DNA, then this will recruit T7 RNA polymerase and transcribe the T broccoli and stop its transcription. Okay, so this, if we uh, describe it in terms of like symbiotic language, this will be actually an open circuit because it will just keep operate as long as we have active ingredients. Okay, we can create something a bit more interesting. We can, for example, ask this component to produce a bicomponent in here, which is a T7 inhibitory RNA optimer that will actually bind to the RNA producing machinery, RNA polymerase, and inactivate it. Okay. So if I have this component here, then this will actually inhibit the production of itself. Okay. So this will be actually auto inhibitory or cis inhibitory circuit. Uh, so then if I test those both, circuits, then we get something like this. So we have this open circuit, which gives us this good level of transcription. And then we also get this auto inhibitor circuit. And basically like very little transcription might have gone up, but then it does not produce itself because it's self inhibitory. Okay. 
So this is a bit interesting, but we can do something even more interesting by designing something that inhibits the other component. Okay, so here I have two different elements, and then one element is actually inhibiting the other, right? So this is producing an oh, sorry RNA optomer against a different type of RNA polymerase, which is sp6 here, and then it's going to inhibit production of this orange RNA, which gives us a different type of uh, first and signal. So if I have those two templates in here at the same time, then you can see that the production of the orange thing doesn't go very well because it has been inhibited by the others. Okay, And while the green guy just gets produced very well because it doesn't have any inhibition. Okay, So this will be an uh, example of the trans inhibitory. And actually, we can design another pair that's going to do exactly kind of a opposite thing, which is inhibiting the T7 uh, RNA polymerase. So if we mix those two DNA templates that inhibit, let's say, each other like this. So in here, I have the uh, T7 inhibitory optomer that inhibits this guy. And this guy is also going to try to inhibit the other, right? So we have this two components that's trying to inhibit each other. So if one component is somehow dominating in the very beginning, this will just keep dominating because it's going to inhibit the other one. And that's the same story for the other DNA template, right? So this system is kind of mathematically described as a bistable system. A system has two stable points, or in more biological term, it can be also called as a toggle switch. And this has been actually uh, one of the most important uh, application in the beginning of synthetic biology. So I have just recreate this using some minimal components, which does not involve uh, protein, that many protein interactions. Okay. So I hope this gave you some feeling about how we do uh, top-down synthetic biology. And uh, I'll actually move on to the bottom synthetic biology, which might be even more interesting. Okay. So in here, people usually talk about using unnatural molecules to reproduce Remergent behaviors, but I will say we can also use natural molecules like DNA, RNA, for example, but in an unnatural way to create those behaviors. So I'm just expanding this a little bit. And of course, when we are talking about emergent, emergent behavior, we are quite often talking about recreating this cell like behavior and less of a cellular functions. And before actually thinking about building a cell, we can just pause and think about how complex that task is, okay? So let's just think about, you know, uh, how many components do we have in the simplest organism such as an E. coli? So an E. coli is an object with the one micron in size, okay? And it has many, many kind of active ingredients, active molecules, component that does different functions. So let's compare it to the complexity of some of the men, some of the objects made by a human. It could be a chair, for example, which has around 10 components. We can also think about an awesome Death Star, this Lego one. So it has around 3,000 components. And we can also think about a Tesla Model 3, this has around 400,000 components. And we also have a big airplane, Airbus A380. This has 4 million parts to fly. So which one will be the closest to the complexity of an E. coli, which is the simplest cell? Actually, the answer is the Airbus, because E. coli has around 6 million parts inside of it. And the reason is, even though quite often we draw E. coli as an you know, empty homogeneous envelope, actually the amount of active molecules inside those E. coli is a lot. So it is 
a situation where you know it is like half fish half water so if you just you know look at inside then it's really highly packed and you have lots of many active molecules inside the nuclei okay so basically recreating a nuclei will be like you know building an entire aircraft so it's you know you can imagine that it's not going to be an easy task at all yeah so therefore when we talk about like you know recreating those like like behaviors like cell division uh, energy production and things like that we do not uh, talk about yes airbus yeah sorry to spot it later yeah so we quite often think about like only a couple of functions right so that's what we tend to do in this field because it, building the entire thing is like crazy level of engineering task okay so i'll just introduce my approach here okay so i use the dna which is a genetic material as a material to build and create stops and there are many good things about dna as a materials perspective so if you look at this uh, B form double stranded DNA, which is the most typical form of a DNA. Basically, DNA is a biopolymer with four different types of monomers and has the genetic information. Oh, sorry. And if you look at the actually dimension of this double stranded DNA, the width of a double helix is around two nanometer, and the distance between the neighboring base pair is only 0.3 nanometer. So if we make some structure or uh, working agent out of it, you can see that it's immediately going to be like nanoscale object, which gives us very similar resolution that we can achieve with other biomolecules like proteins. Okay, so it already is quite promising. It is also very stable and quite cheap to produce as well. So how we actually use DNA as a material? So to make the designing process easier, we actually do abstraction of this DNA structure. And what do we mean by that? So let's imagine that we have this very short double-stranded DNA, so which has basically two lines of DNA with following sequences uh, written here, like AJTC, blah, blah, blah. And then one important feature of the DNA is that uh, this partner DNA has complementary DNA sequence, right? So the A binds to the T and G binds to C and so on, right? So if you know the sequence of one DNA, you know the sequence of the other DNA. And quite often, we are not very you know, interested in how this double helix actually look like, okay? So in because of that reason, we usually just represent those DNA with the those lines with arrows. So arrows uh, represents the direction for the three prime usually, and then we can put the sequences like this. Okay, to which are the complementary sequences. And if you just think a little bit more, then actually the actual sequence of that DNA doesn't matter. So what matters in this case for us if we design something? is the fact that those two DNA will bind by having complementary DNA sequence, okay? So we then just call this DNA with some having some specific domains in this case by having domains D1 and D1 prime. And prime meaning that this D1 prime has a complementary sequence with the D1, okay? And we don't even need to think about the uh, actual sequence. We're just gonna work with the domain level. Okay, so that's how we abstract this DNA structure. And so let's, let me give you some example of how we actually make some structure, the actual designing process. So we quite often just represent those double-stranded DNA into either two lines or this big helix, or sorry, big uh, cylinder. And if you want to actually bring two double-stranded DNA, next to the other just to create these two lines and what you can do is designing this new short dna which will actually connect those two white straight lines of dna 
and hold them in this place. Okay, and because those sequences need to be complementary to each other, if we know the sequence of the white part, then you know the sequence of this red part. Okay, so the sequence of the red DNA is determined by this geometry. Yeah, so this red DNA will actually hold these two helices together. And well, if you look at this in 2D, it kind of looks like stapler, right? So that's why we call this often as a staple DNA. And you can actually generalize this approach to build, to bring many DNA helices next to each other to create this 2D seed. And if you just think about it, you can just modulate the height of your DNA double helix on different locations. And then you're gonna actually, you know, be able to draw this uh, envelopes, right? And you can just draw any envelopes. So in 2006, Nature paper by Paul Rosmond, he developed this technique called DNA origami, where actually basically you can create arbitrary 2D patterns. And of course, people have developed this technique to create 3D structures and even structures with the curvatures, right? So you can build pretty much any structure you want, you know, depending on it has the right size. So how we actually build a structure in this field. So we take top-down approach for this. So we don't start with the domains, we start with the geometry. So there are many software tools that allows you to draw outline of your structure that you like to achieve. And then those programs will, let's say, uh, rasterize your structure and will draw the lines that you need to form this structure. And then those lines will be basically used to generate those short DNA, series of the DNAs that you need to form this structure, okay? So if I give you some, yeah. So this is how we actually build the structure. And you can also use the DNA to do some computations, okay? And actually, what do I mean by that? So, this is a part of the formalism called uh, chemical reaction network or molecular computing, but it's done with the DNA. Okay, so in here we consider a reaction between uh, small molecules in here, which is the binding of those DNA molecules. So for DNA, we have a couple of basic reactions. One will be the easiest one will be hybridization between strands with complementary sequences, right? So if you have two single-stranded DNA with complementary sequences, they will bind to each other, right? Easy. We have a slightly more interesting one, which is a strand exchange reaction. So in here, we have two species of DNA. One is a partial double-stranded DNA with this red domain, which we call toehold, being single-stranded. And the other complex, it's just a single-stranded DNA, but has this red complementary domain and also this complementary domain to the binding domain, okay? So if you mix those two species, they will actually bind each other through toehold, and then this gray DNA is actually able to displace this black DNA and release it, right? So, those reactions we can actually kind of write down in the language of this chemical reaction, okay? Yeah. So in this case, we have started with two separate molecules and they form a complex. So if we just write that down, just by using uh, chemistry 101, then it would mean A plus B going to the AB complex, yep. And this exchange reaction, so we can call those each molecules separately. So if we write them down in an equation, it will look like A plus BC complex. So BC is this complex, just becomes this AC complex. And then you have this B molecule just popping out. Okay. And because we can control many, many different reactions just by changing the sequence of the DNA while keeping the geometry relatively similar, we can form almost all the uh, molecular reactions that we want with this scheme. So which actually allows us to 
for example, use this kind of uh, software tool called Visual DSD. It was DSD. It was developed by Microsoft. So what this tool does is this tool allows you to put a code of your reactions, such as, for example, an end gate or or gate, or it could be uh, some more complex network of this computation. And it will actually generate the set of DNA sequences that you need to for, perform those algorithms, right? So this design process is automated. You can also use uh, software tools like a new pack that basically allows us allows you to design this molecular species uh, and generate the sequences you want. So we can use those uh, tools to generate those DNA sequences. Okay. So I have been working on those two systems, and the goal, my current goal, is actually creating. Uh, cell like systems by using those two components, like the structural component from DNA origami and this uh, reaction components and or computational components from this uh, strand displacement reactions. Okay, so <clears throat> however, even though people have done a lot of interesting things with the DNA computation, like they have done like create this end gates or molecular reactions and things like that, which are very, very highly programmable. But if you think about how we actually do it, the reaction is just a one-off reaction. You prepare those species, you mix them, and they will go to the equilibrium. So that's not quite what we want for our artificial cells. For example, if we take example of what's going on in a real cell, so if we design a computational reaction network or genetic circuits, they will just keep operating as long as the system is alive and active, right? So it's gonna operate continuously. And that's what we want for our artificial systems, okay? Uh, however, if we just try to take those systems in nature and use it for applications, it's not going to be super easy because it's not very straightforward to engineer those uh, protein-based interactions and develop a new system that we want, okay? In comparison, like designing some system like that in DNA attack, DNA computation would be quite straightforward because we know which sequences should interact with, with other sequences, okay? So one of the things that I have tried is to build a platform that will allow us to run those, you know, DNA or RNA-based reaction that runs continuously. Yeah, so for example, uh, in this case, maybe we want to have a real cell or it could be an artificial cell as well that run things like this, you know, as long as it wants, okay? So if we think about the current scheme, like the current goal standard of the DNA computing and what they are using, they start with this multi-stranded DNA complex that has this toehold and this uh, bound DNA. And then when you have an input, then you know it will go through this strand displacement reaction and you know give you this alpha strand. Okay. Um, can we use this directly to build those continuous operating system, okay? So then let's say we transcribe all of those three strands that are part of the system, okay? And then what's going to happen is that this longest strand the here, the black one, will just, rather than forming this intermediate complex, it's just gonna bind with this output, sorry, this, uh, long DNA because it has the strongest interaction, right? So rather than, you know, going through this displacement scheme, we will just have this products going into the waste directly, right? So this is not controlled and like we cannot use this scheme by just producing the RNA, right? So we need something new. So what I have focused 
is actually how we can create this multi-stranded complex so that it can you know, serve as a component for those RNA strain displacement reactions. So what people are doing to form this is mixing those two strands in a separate reaction and going to thermal annealing. And of course, we can't do it in a cell either. So I have used uh, transcription of RNA, but with the self-cleaving ribozymes at the end of this hairpin-like structure. So I have put two self-cleaving ribozymes in here and here. And if everything goes well, then this will make double cleavage. And then because we have like double cleavages, this ribozyme bit will dissociate from the uh, hairpin-like structure, making this structure now look like this multi-stranded RNA complex that is actually ready to do RNA strand displacement reaction. So one good thing about this scheme is we don't need to worry about the stoichiometry of this multi-stranded complex because it's going to be automatically one-to-one. -one. And the assembly will be also quite good because this strand will form this hairpin and then it's going to be quite stable. Okay, so I have designed the scheme and tested it if we can actually do uh, run some continuously operating circuit uh, in in vitro transcription. And then this is the data, for example, in here where I was transcribing this multi-stranded complex and then designing the output to give us this, uh, for instance, activation signal. So if we don't have the input or if the RNA cleavage is kind of uh, neutralized, then I don't get any signal. And in comparison, if I have active RNA cleavages and the input, then I get a decent signal of this circuit. And I was able to operate, for example, two scale cascade of this version to kind of uh, have a bit more generalization of this scheme. And I'm currently actually working on so that uh, we can have even more complex circuits uh, to be implemented in synthetic cells. So with this being established, actually my current goal is to use it uh, to create some interesting protocell system that we can build. Okay, So this system will basically be a big giant vesicle encapsulating RNA transcribing machineries and then I'll use my technique to run this RNA computation. And in plus, it's going to have a synthetic DNA-based nanopore on its membrane. And that really allows us to do many interesting things. Okay, So basically, I will run this uh, RNA reaction circuits by transcription. And then this nanopore, this is protein. This is by render. It doesn't have this DNA or gamma yet. So I just use the channel protein. So it allows us to you know, uh, take few molecules, for example, in here, NTPs inside of the cell, so it can you know, keep producing the RNA molecules. And one very interesting thing that we can do, this is the schematic of the DNA structure, non-structure that I'm going to use, is that it can be blocked by adding some specific RNA sequence. And uh, let, me do, do, do. let me go to the next slide. Yeah, and then we can actually configure the output of this RNA displacement reaction network so that it can, for example, block the uh, activity of a pore, right? So this will be the kind of first demonstration of a, kind of a, this artificial cell system, which can actually, you know, have an encoded mechanism to open and close its own pore. And its mechanism will just purely depend on the output of this computational circuit. So we can basically you know, implement arbitrary calculation that will lead us to the modulation of the pore activity. And one of the simplest things that I can do with this system is, for example, having a, uh, having a homeostasis of the RNA level. So basically, I can just uh, use RNA blocker uh, being produced by this uh, DNA template. This is a very simple scheme. And then if we have a lot of RNA, it's going to block the pore. 
and then it's going to actually reduce the concentration of the building block because we are digesting the RNA block inside the cell. And then if the concentration goes down, it's going to recover the level. And then we can actually also modulate which level that we want to stay. We can introduce some like threshold by just sequestrating some of the RNA strand by putting some known concentration of the DNA. And then they will allow us to you know, change the level of the equilibrium that the cells is going to be. So that will be quite interesting homeostasis system that I can actually build on. Yeah, so this will be quite interesting cell mimic. And then of course, we can also think about using it for sensing all drug delivery applications. Yeah, and I'll just update it with the current uh, progress. So we are trying to, um, trying to build it uh, currently by just using double emerger method. So this is just a method to produce those GUBs in very high throughput manner. Uh, and then we have actually already built some GUVs. And now we are in a process of actually encapsulating those RNA components to uh, try to do some RNA computations inside. And we also engineering the uh, DNA based on pores so that we can put that on the membrane. Okay, so that's the uh, status of this project. And I'll just, I'll finish the talk just by introducing one more project that's going on. So I am interested in the cellular heterogeneity as well. And what do we mean by that? That means a process where we have like identical a set of cells that has identical genome, but showing different phenotypes when we have things like environmental stress or things like that. Okay, so that has been known in biological system for many years, uh, and there can be many reasons for that. You know, like if you think about how many copies of molecules we have in the cells, there's actually not many for many components, and that means the copy number being you know one, two, three, or five can really make a difference on your system's equilibrium point, which will actually affect, you know, if you have bistability or like this feedback system. And that can also come from a symmetric partitioning when you uh, when your cells divide, you can have like one molecule here and three molecules there, which can eventually lead to metabolic heterogeneity of your cell. So it is quite interesting in the field of synthetic biology because in synthetic biology, we ask cells to do something by consuming those resources, which normally goes for the growth, but by redirecting them to produce molecule of interest that we want, okay? So that actually takes away the resources from this pool and people quite call them as a burden, right? And interesting things come out if you actually think about the burden and the heterogeneity, right? So if you ask the cells to do those things by engineering them, some cells will do them very well. So they will produce a lot of molecules, but those cells will usually have slow growth rate because they are using the, a lot of their resources to produce those things. And some of the cells, you know, will be just lazy and will not produce that much of your molecules of interest, but they will grow faster, okay? So that's fine for the initial generation, but for many synthetic biology applications, people talk about cultures of you know thousands of liters, right? So that requires a heck of a lot of growth cycles. So even though you start with you know pretty much nice homogeneous response from your population, as your generations go by, it is a general case that your yield goes down because simply your population is replaced by you know, those cells that has higher growth rate, but with low production. So that's, I think, a big problem in synthetic biology. So I like to solve it by doing single cell analysis, but at the same time, you know, like looking at the cell while it's growing, it is like engineering or looking at the airplane while it is flying. Okay, so that's my justification to not use the cell, but to use this uh, artificial cell that's produced by uh, this microfluidic system. So I have a collaborator in Japan who actually developed 
high throughput microfluidic device. So that will allow us to do this single cell analysis. So I'm gonna just sort those artificial cells, encode it with the synthetic biological circuits, and then basically see what's going on at single cell, but at high molecule resolution with maybe epifluorescence, or it could be also turf molecules as well, and to get some insight on like which component is a limiting factor or which component has the highest correlation with those different behaviors and things like that. Okay, so I think my time is up, so I'll just probably uh, finish my presentation here by acknowledging my funders and my collaborators, and I would like to thank you for your attention and we we'll be happy to take questions as well. Thank you very much. That was great. Um, I especially like the genetic circuit part of the work because we work on similar stuff. Um, mm -hmm. There are some questions in chat. Can you see chat? Yeah, I'll have a look. If you can read the question out loud, that's going to be for the recording because the chat doesn't yeah. show on recording. Sure, yeah. So Brian asked, uh, how complex is the toggle switch we can build? Uh, so, right, yeah. So a toggle switch usually most cases refers to a system with two stable points, right? So you have two states that you can switch with. Uh, so also building a system with more than two becomes, you know, like, uh, how do you call it? Uh, like infinitely, not sorry, uh, exponentially more difficult, right? Because you are introducing more molecules and then you have to consider uh, building in consider interaction between those components, right? So if you introduce one, actually you need to think about how it's going to interact with all other components, right? So it is possible to build a three-state switch. I've seen them, but I think, for example, like building a four-state switch could be quite difficult. But I have a colleague uh, who is actually an applied mathematician in Cambridge who has come up with a theoretical model uh, that you can build on a system with arbitrary number of stable systems. Okay, so in principle, you know, like in principle, if we use DNA or RNA computation circuits, where you can actually build almost infinite number of parallel reactions, you can actually build that. But with the proteins, I think it will be a, of course, with the DNA is still difficult, but with the proteins, it's going to be a huge engineering uh, task. Yes. So there's formulation, but experimentally is a bit more difficult. And the next question is from Catherine. Uh, Catherine asks, is, is strand displacement very sensitive to conditions like uh, concentration of magnesium ion or temperature, right? Uh, and how can it be uh, engineered to be more robust, okay? Yeah. So, you're very right by saying that the strand displacement reactions are sensitive to environmental factors, such as the ion concentration, magnesium concentration, of course, but uh, in general for the uh, most of the positive ions as well, because DNA has negative backbone charge, right? So any plus ions inside your solution will basically affect how often those two DNA strands will, you know, collide, right? By uh, screening their in electric repulsions, right? So that matters a lot. Um, and the temperature as well, because in many cases, especially the dynamics, uh, there are certain small barriers that you need to overcome to do this uh, strand displacement reaction. And of course, if you increase the temperature by let's say five degree, then I think your reaction will get faster by you know tenfold or even more or something like that. And yeah, the leakage has been quite an issue for some of the designs of those DNA computation circuits. And people have, for example, used uh, things like a blocker. I think the typical one is having a blocker strand to uh, take up any of the uh, how do I say, unoptimized structure from your reaction, right? So you can use a blocker strand, uh, or you can also have 
an energy bias, like having a mismatch from your initial configuration, right? So that you start with a less stable system. And as your reaction goes, you go to more stable system by repairing those uh, mismatched uh, double-stranded uh, bindings, okay? So there are a couple of techniques that you can use uh, to make it a bit more robust. You can also include things like the buffers or correction reactions, but I think those two are the most famous ones. And uh, Perez asked how many uh, those gates to work orthogonally. Yeah, so the orthogonality depends on the length of a toe hold. And a typical length of a toe hold that people use, the single-stranded red part used for the recognition is, I think, six nucleotide. It could be eight, but typically six, I think. And then, you know, uh, DNA has four different types of bases. So if you have six nucleotides to play, then uh, you can have four to the power of six different gates in principle that can operate orthogonally, right? Of course, like having five out of six match will give you some rate uh, that can go on, but that will be like an order of magnitude slower. And Mohammed uh, put a question uh, here, which is, is DNA-based reaction circuit superior or easier to design than uh, making uh, functional genome or artificial uh, made from artificial or natural genes. Yeah. So for the, uh, if you compare the DNA based reaction circuits to protein based reaction circuits, where you need to basically know what would be the affinity between those two proteins, I think it would be much, much easier to design DNA based reactions because we know about their DNA kinetics very well. You know, if we have two pieces of DNA, we know how fast they bind. Uh, and if you have uh, DNA reactions with defined number of uh, DNA toeholds, actually you can tune the reaction rates as well. If you increase one nucleotide on the toehold, then your reaction becomes faster by like half order of magnitude, something like that. So you can tune the rate. Uh, and the rate is also quite known very well, right? So if you and then you also know that which sequences should bind to which other, right? So the DNA, DNA based reaction will be much easier to design. Yeah. If it's RNA, it is slightly more difficult than DNA, but I think it's still a bit easier than the proteins. Yeah. And Sam asked, uh, is there any issue with the misfolding of the RNA during the strand displacement case? Yeah. And is can modeling uh, help? Uh, do, do, do. have a giving insight for the folding pathway uh, or is by is using some stress specific DNA sequences would help folding the RNA in a correct form. Okay, so yes, that's very true. And in here, the problem is slightly more complex because in this RNA uh, reaction circuit, we are talking about a dynamic system, right? So it is quite well known in the field of RNA that the, you know, as you as the RNA gets produced, so the RNA gets produced by the scale of, you know, when you have the RNA machinery binding, and then the RNA base comes one by one to get your RNA. And then the rate for synthesis is like, I think between tens of base nucleotides or hundreds of nucleotides per minute. Okay. So it's fast, but like not instantaneously. Yeah, but if you compare that speed with the speed of the RNA, you know, if you have an RNA hairpin, how fast it's going to fold, if it's going to fold to a hairpin, it is order of like millisecond or even microsecond, right? Depending on the, uh, depending on the condition, right? So it is quite well known that your RNA can undergo some, you know, suboptimal uh, structure that you get as you, you know, produce your RNA, you don't have your whole RNA just suddenly appearing. So you have always part of your RNA appearing and then that can lead to some metastable uh, transient structure that could actually, you know, hamper your folding, right? So that is 
called co-transcription of the RNA. And it is, in my opinion, largely unsolved question, right? So people have gathered some good insights on how the RNA gets folded in a final form, but how fast it's going to fold is a very, very difficult question because basically you need to track those, you know, pathways uh, as you synthesize your RNA, right? So that's a very, very computationally heavy task. And uh, I would say we don't have a very good way of predicting it yet, okay? And, but there's one thing, but there are a couple of things that you can do. One of the thing is uh, to minimize the formation of this unwanted hairpin during the transcription by, for example, uh, reducing the GC content of your RNA, that helps. Or you can even use only three, you know, bases out of three monomers out of four uh, on your specific part of RNA, right? So if you, for example, take out G or C completely from your RNA element, and then that bit will not have very serious secondary structure by itself, right? So that's a common technique that you can use, yeah? Okay, so I think I covered everything on the chat. Yeah, it's a great set of questions indeed, yes. Yeah, I think these are all the questions. Um, I, I, I just wanna say, I really like your um, gate, the logic gate system because Mm -hmm. We need that not only for controlling cell states, but you know we're working on similar systems for controlling gene expression, and this is a difficult problem. But I'm really glad people are working on it. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. So the like ideal goal will be also like trying to apply to more cell-like systems. You know, I'm I'm gonna probably mainly play on the DNA level at the moment just to you know, establish some systems. But the hope and the goal is actually, yes, yeah, to be able to use them for more cell-like systems where it can interf interface with the DNA, uh, with the proteins or other components, yes. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. And thanks everyone else. Have a great day, afternoon, whatever time it is for you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, thank you for the invitation. And uh, yeah, it was a really pleasure. Yeah, and enjoy your day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.